OK, uh, we're going to start our uh, presentation today. So um, welcome everybody to the History of Medicine and Nursing webinar series. Uh, this is the lecture on the 25th of January and we have two talks, talk, two speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Uh, Naima al Ghazair, and she is a, uh, trained as a nurse and uh, in Bahrain and went to the College of Health Sciences in Bahrain to uh, obtain a nursing and midwifery degree. She is now uh, currently um, uh, the WHO uh, representative in Egypt since August of 2020 and she has 30 years of experience at country, regional, international level in the area of health sciences, humanitarian development to protect health and health security uh, ac accountability. Uh, she's now going to give us a talk today for about 40 minutes um, uh, on uh, her topic uh, from local to global in nursing and midwifery. Uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Gazer, can you please start your talk? Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm very pleased to be today and honored to be invited by Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland to give a very quick brief on where we are. I chose the title and the purpose in the title from local to global nursing and midwifery from land of immortality to the world and what I meant in how my country shaped me in presenting. The key points that I would like to present is the journey of building on the first RCSI webinar titled Shaping Nursing in the East Mediterranean Region that was presented by my friend and colleague, Dr. Fariba Al-Darazi, as she brought several points. At this point, I would like to congratulate RCSI for having this series of webinar that we be all abreast on the past and at the same time our current and the future. I would like also at this point to acknowledge all the nurses, healthcare providers, physicians, students who have been actually working for the COVID-19. Today, I would also address the links between the milestones from my local experience, my own presence in my country, to the region, to the global, and taking, through, taking you through the journey of the life, of my life, documenting the steps, how it has shaped my presence today. Uh, why I say my? Because I believe there was a very close work done in my country through political commitment that allowed us to move forward. Then also we'll talk about lessons learned and way forward. The framework that I'm using, I will just want to confirm that you are seeing the slides. John? Yes, yes, yes. You're doing very well. Your voice is good and strong. And I can see you very well and your slides are perfect. They're very good. So, okay. so keep going. Yeah. OK, and then I would like to bring the framework that I abused is how to build on, on the previous of my history. And the nursery in Bahrain Health History to present shaping our future nexus, sustaining the care and caring. Uh, the presentation will address intertwine the social, economic, personal, professional, volunteerism and environment together. More importantly, is the opportunity given and political commitment by the government and by the society in investing in human being. I'm giving example of my country, Bahrain, to position globally. The key message will go throughout is to solidarity and united for health and not merely sickness. This makes me to bring us always to the definition of health and what do we mean? The definition of the World Health Organization, we are talking about health and not sickness. One of the key things that have always guided me is actually help of everyone is connected and is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security. It's dependent upon the fullest cooperation of us as individuals, families, communities, and the states, besides the institution. I decided to share with you the health in the SDGs era as the heart and the purpose I'm sharing this, because this is now our current and the future until 2030. However, this is where I have been shaped in my country to think of how the people, poor people live, how the, uh, in terms of making sure the good nutrition, the education, the gender, and I will come back to that. And if I look at the cycle, this is where we are. There have been several milestones that I wanted to share. The family and neighborhood, and the school, how it shaped me, Bahrain independence in 1971, 
and the College of Health Sciences that I joined as a school of nursing and then shaped us further. American University of Beirut that I did my bridging Bachelor of Science in Nursing linking to Bahrain where I got a fellowship from uh, WHO. The University of Illinois where I did my Master and PhD degree in Nurse Midwifery and the Women's Health were thinking of the length of the primary health care beside learning about World Health Organization's collaborating centers. RCSI Healthcare Management course in 1996 was one of the courses that brought the team and actually shaped uh, our thinking on how multidisciplinary, multi-sector work we need to do for ensuring the health of the population. I have added in this slide, in case the time shorts, how the different milestones uh, in nursing happen that shaped pre preparing us to be engaged at the international forum. For example, through volunteerism, the International Planned Parenthood, through volunteering with the Bahrain Family Planning Association. My role in, pre in, in uh, repositioning as one of the, the only nurse in the national committees for the World Summits, the 1994 Summit on Population, the Women Empowerment in Beijing in 1995, and the Social Summit in 1995. Also, uh, Dr. Fariba mentioned last week, in our role and engagement, not only with WHO, but also with International Council of Nurses, the National Confederation of Midwives, and in my role, I was also engaged with the Commonwealth Medical Association on the human rights and women's health, reproductive health of persons, especially focused on women. Beside the work that we did together at the Gulf Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, United Nations Population Fund, to do on a family health survey in the six Gulf states and the nurses in Bahrain played a major role in implementing it. So I wanted to put this at the the milestones. I was born at the hospital in 1958, so it already was mentioned about the where the shaping of the nursing and midwifery were there. And in that time, it was the reason I bring my birth has been a very interesting thing that came from the family to the hospital to be given a birth. My mom was a, uh, it's called child marriage if today they call it. She was 15 when she gave birth. This is very important as a first birth, as a, as a first born to my parents, a girl instead of a boy. And the message went to my father, sorry, we are having a, a girl and not a boy. I'm always saying this milestone in my life because it shaped the thinking. My father said she, that my late father treated was born 11 months gender. I was cherished as a young a newborn to the family, whether I'm a girl or a boy. Family, school and neighborhood. When I was in the fourth grade, the World Health uh, Week was announced, and I was a nursing, I was a, school, a primary healthcare school student. In the primary healthcare, we were told on, that there is going to be a celebration of the World Health Day. The definition of the health was defined for us, and at the same time, a competition was made at the school, at the uh, neighborhoods, the be best classroom, the best thing. Why I am bringing this? The World Health today is still celebrated today, but not like in our era that the school and community celebrated the focus then, I remember very much, it was about sanitation, environment and hygiene. And it was not about sickness and tertiary care. That shaped me very well early on. Our schools taught us how to take care of ourselves and individuals. This is actually what I took with me throughout my experience in, in, in uh, my profession in nursing. And I said neighborhood because it also allowed us to work in the neighborhood and the school. As young ones, we were responsible for the cleanliness and hygiene. Today, we maybe they call it child labor, but it was not child labor. It actually shaped our thinking and our approach. The other milestone in my in, in the nurse in the what happened in the health system in Bahrain was beside the College of Health Sciences, the declaration of primary health care in Al Maata in 1978. And I was very honored to be one young of the nursing students to be a member of the workshop that was done in Bahrain 
right before Almata to sensitize, and it's done nursing student, to sensitize all of us what is the primary health care about. And if we look at the definition of the primary health care, the true definition, I'm not talking about the medical model. It talked about the, having the access to the decent housing, safe environment, cooking facilities, transportation, livelihoods, better living conditions. And I remember this very well, including stating very clearly using sound technology, socially acceptable, culturally acceptable, which we are talking about today. So that was another shaping on where we need to be bringing from our local to the global. The community health nursing that was taught to us, we started our program from health rather than sickness. We started from selecting individuals, families and communities and looking at what we call today social determinants of health, looking at all angles. That's why I have put these photos again. This is shaping how we address health and how we are as healthcare professionals are actually protecting health, supporting health, and then doing the cure and then the, the, the rehabilitation. Milestone during College of Health Sciences that shaped most of us, including my classmates, and I remember them very vividly, whether it's Dr. Badri El Kuwaiti, who are today, actually she is the, she was the chief nurse until very recently and retired now, uh, Mrs. Sumaya Hussain, who actually was my classmate, and I'm very proud of her. She who reached to do the quality. And then we have uh, Masuma and we have Saida. Everybody did a good job. But why I put this milestone? Because Florence Nightingale was introduced to us as a scientist, but at the same time, we had nursing faculty who were the, four, the first uh, three or four nursing faculty, Bahrainis, who were teaching us. And the whole thing was about how can we have the elements of the courage, the passion, our commitment, dedication of care, but at the same time have the ethical value in our systems of work. We were also taught by non-Bahrainis and the one whom I remember, Mrs. Amal Khashabad, Mrs. Nana Kuti, who they gave us the, pro the, the community health. Why I'm talking about some names? Because there was a competition of who can know what are the causes of some of the risks that will lead to the diseases. So we were asked to go and read and search and bring the evidence for the change. This shaped also our, uh, our uh, nursing very early on. I always use this slide because this slide for whether we are nursing students, whether we are physician, we are pharmacist, whatever. But to me, when I look at the Florence Nightingale and see that in 1863, she has really done the infection control. And today we are talking about infection control globally and at the same time of care. So we can protect people, especially in the health facilities and linking health and the financing and economy. It says I'm fain to sum up with an urgent appeal for adopting this or some uniform system of publishing the statistical records of hospitals. If they could be obtained, they would show subscribers how their money was being spent, what amount of goods was really being done with it, or whether the money was doing mischief rather than the good. This is in 1863. It is true today and it's going to be true tomorrow. We are talking about health financing, health economy, but at the same time investment in health and trying to reduce the burden of disease. This quote shaped me very early on for a reason, because then in Bahrain, that was a milestone. The, the government invested in us to actually bring always, we used to call it problem solving, slowly so we did survey and then we did the research to bring a change and what we those days we were called the innovative change. And in the lower part is actually the time we are taking the oath because the oath was really very important for us as students, future healthcare providers to actually believe in it and be, walk with it, walk the talk with it. And I put this one, research is not a luxury that is affordable only in times of plenty, but is continuing necessity. Never, whether it is an emergency, which is happening in several of our countries in the region today, conflicts or wars. And I want to go back to, I think it was Fiona when she mentioned or about the RCSI webinar, is this that we need to be ready throughout and preparedness is a key. And I remember during the first GCCWHO meeting, on inter-country, on maternal 
uh, neonatal child health, I was chosen and I was the only nurse to be preparing for the whole, organizing for the whole uh, GCC uh, physicians, majority, all of them, almost all of them were the head of the maternal child health to speak on how can we look and improve the first strategy of maternal newborn child health in our region. So that's again is engagement multidisciplinary and not seeing that the nurses are a follower was positioned by my senior, that is her, His Excellency Minister of Health then to be actually part of the of the multidisciplinary, multi-sectorial. The College of Health Sciences in Bahrain, which was one of the first graduates of associate degree, shaped the thinking in a way we started. We started as multidisciplinary group learning together the different scientific, which is the call today. That shaped us to be actually eager to continue our education in the photo is there are two mentors coach, I would say. One of them is the one who is shaking my hand, His Excellency Minister of Health then, Dr. Ali Fakhro, and the other one, Dr. Nabil Qurunful, who has really shaped the nurse, the whole health profession education in Bahrain. And he is still one of our mentors, and we are very proud that we learned under him. But with them, we actually were prepared to continue our education. Why I say this? Because there was investment, a political commitment by Bahrain government to invest in the health resource persons in order to deliver the best of health services. And that was, there was a policy in the ministry to prepare the second line, the third line, and the fourth line for the future, or for the college or for the services in Bahrain. My, I continued to American University of Beirut as a, on a scholarship of WHO, but also University of Illinois at Chicago. Now, shaping in Bahrain, it was emphasized the same, it was broadened horizon at American University of Beirut. What I learned there is actually being prepared for emergencies, conflicts, uh, I don't know, wars, internal conflicts. That prepared me a lot. And that's what I took later back to Bahrain and then to the region and to the globe. My milestone before I joined the WHO, and these are milestones for history for Bahrain. The first WHO collaborating center in the region was established in 1990, headed by Dr. Fariba Al-Darazi, and I was her successor. Very proudly, we worked together to make it happen. We first knew about collaborating centers in 1983 and 84, when the University of Illinois in 84 became the first WHO collaborating center in the United States. So this pushed us that we want to be one. The second, which was milestone for Bahrain, for the first time a Bahraini was chosen to be on the Global Advisory of Nursing and Midwifery to the Director General of the WHO. And then followed that we were also became the secretary, not the secretary, member of the Global Network of WHO Collaborating Center Secretariat between 1992 until 1996. And the culmination was that the first global uh, WHO Global uh, Network conference was held in Bahrain. And still we are very proud that the Bahrainis really excel to present Bahrain and beyond. Now, uh, I, this slide shows that it was covered by all the media and having relationship with the media and press was one of the things I learned very early on from Bahrain that we needed to bring the journalists out with us so they can understand our language. I will not dwell on the milestones of the GCC because Dr. Kariba, she covered it very well last week, but the key message has been always united voice among nurses, sharing and consensus building, and we nearly, really need to not to take the flag of profession, more than important, the flag of protecting the individuals, families, women, children, and adolescents. The approaches used has been networking, being direct and candid, transparent, soft diplomacy has been used, ethical codes, belief in communities, and engagement, tolerance, inclusiveness, and conducive environment. These might be words, but we have walked the talk and we can demonstrate. I'll give an example. For example, when we did the midwifery law, it took us almost a year or two years by bringing a smaller group 
I'm talking about Bahrainis and non-Bahrainis around the table to discuss about the midwifery law beside the studying and searching and finding so we can have a law that is everybody buy in by the time it's going to be discussed and negotiated. Not only nurses and midwives, but we also brought the obstetricians and gynecologists, policymakers far ahead of time before we really engaged into this. So the assessing the situation, engaging, mobilizing, and learning from the research always brought us that we need to be forefront. I have this slide to show that always we had to balance between our personal uh, interest, our volunteerism, professional engagement, and our role at the gover as government employees. We have participated with flag. I'm always showing it because it was the first time we presented by a Bahrain a paper at the conference. However, the first time there was an observer from Bahrain was in 1977. Opportunities and support by the officials in this in this uh, thing is not trying to depict myself, but I want to show that how much the ministers and the government invested. With Nelson Mandela, it was a, this is a two o'clock in the morning meeting in the social summit, and he was very surprised to see a woman among the five men, men membership in the delegation of Bahrain heading at the social summit. The reason I'm putting this because it shows that the government invested on the gender equity, equal opportunities, and at the same time, giving the former it rather than by positioning in different things. So this is still going on through our, for example, social, um, the Supreme Council for Women in Bahrain. I have to appreciate several. I have the photo here with Dr. Habden Mahler, who was the guru or the founder of the primary health care. He is here with me because we, I was advisor to him on gender panel for International Planned Parenthood Federation. However, he is my guru because he made a statement in 1985 that in, for primary health care to really materialize, nurses are the powerhouse for change and need to be invested in. So he really positioned that the first liners are the health workers and the nurses are the front line. Volunteerism, non-governmental organization, this is very early. I just want to show that we always had coaches and mentors and coaches and mentors and influencers beside political commitment are needed. And that is something that we have learned in our history, whether in Bahrain, in the region. So the political commitment and backup are always needed. I was moved or chosen to go to, be, I didn't mention much about Gulf countries, but I want to give a very uh, important aspect. Whatever we did in the Gulf countries, I took it to the global level when I was chosen to be the senior scientist of nursing and midwifery and, and uh, uh, appointed by the director general then. Uh, the, what we did in Bahrain of situation analysis and in the Gulf, and later we did the first strategy for the GCC countries, including our own individual strategies. I took the same experience and did it at the global. The first global uh, strategy for nursing midwifery services, and I'm emphasizing nursing midwifery services, was done based on a global situation record. Then engagement north, south, east, and during my time, the legacy is that I brought developed and developing balance between the genders, and I brought multidiscipline, including economists to the global advisory group. And if you see, there were nine partners there. So it took a few years and it was endorsed by the World Health Assembly in 2002 with the, on, under the patronage for the first time, Her Royal Highness Princess Muna Al Hussein. I put about the health and diplomacy and our different world. I have been graduate from the, uh, in a certificate in health diplomacy from Graduate Institute in Geneva, but this is many of us are doing it and we need it. We need to do it, and I know our government is governments are asking, especially Bahrain, to have these courses be given. And it shows that while we are looking into the, the integrities, especially for nurses, I'm saying we need to see what's happening in our wider community and look at the threats, and at the same time bring others to support us to implement our solutions and innovation. In today's world with COVID-19, 
uh, this is something for the all of us to know. There is international health regulation that is binding, not fully respected. COVID-19 demonstrated that it's not fully respected. Countries are not sharing the surveillance. One thing that we are having and lacking, and I'm talking about what I learned in Bahrain, and then I learned in, at the American University of Beirut the importance of epidemiology, the surveillance, the statistics, and the research and sharing to improve the health conditions of the communities. Now with the pandemic, we are finding that we are now negotiating today that I'm speaking at this forum. We have our executive board negotiating and discussing with the board to push for the COVID-19 pandemic preparedness and response pact to in order for the world to be secure and the health security is part of is a big part of it. Now we're done. OK, this is just some of the questions quickly for the nurses and midwife. One of the questions that we need to do, are we today in Bahrain are at the decision making table? Dr. Fariba last week and I again myself today, I said that we have been at several decision making. For example, with the GCC, I was the first nurse speaking to the ministers of health to in order to have the assessment for the nursing uh, nursing uh, in the Gulf. And it was very fascinating because of the negotiation on how to position that we speak to convince, not others speak. Sometimes the messages does not go through, through the, the, the thing. The joining forces I mentioned, I already showed earlier about the sustainable development goals. I'm sure all of you are well versed with it, but to me it's linked to what I learned in Bahrain under primary healthcare, and I always try to bring the analysis to it. Because in the eight elements of primary health care, there is community engagement, volunteerism, safe water, safe drug, safe food, safe, I mean, it's everything safe, safe, safe. It's all under primary health care principles that we need to use. We are to always be the, the catalyzer. I mentioned already about the volunteerism and professional. Now, here there are some milestones. There is the first. Bahrain Nursing Society that was established early 90 and it's in this board. This was after 30 years with Dr. Leila Murad, Dr. Uh, Ustada Khadij al Gouud, Siham al Sheikh, uh, you know, Dr. Fariba Darazi. I will talk about my predecessors and we're very proud that we have also the young ones in this one, like Mrs. Amina Abdullah was the first Bachelor of Science nurse graduate in Bahrain, but also they were also backing up. Then also we have the first Bahrain Cancer Society where nurses were very active and member of the board. Same with Bahrain Family Planning Association. All this I took it to the region and to the globe. The mentoring and policy of leader support is very important. Taking the, the history here, I already mentioned about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the GCC in, in 1993. But oh, 1990, yes, 1993, but also 1992, but 1994, the regional committee, and we presented, as was mentioned before, to the ministers of health. Nurses have been part of the World Health Assembly and shaping the future. Commitment has been always shown that we need to work to bring to the global, and that's something that really helped me to bring whatever I learned in Bahrain, followed by American University of Beirut, to bring it to my work in Iraq, in Sudan, in Libya, in Egypt, and uh, in Afghanistan, to bring what we call health as a bridge for peace. I put this photo, and, it, and now I'm reflecting also, that I was also, because of AUB, we were able to be ready in 1990, when the, the attack happened, in actually early 1990, yes, when the attack happened in on, 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 uh, in, in Iraq, that we had nurses from Bahrain joined the team to go to Kuwait and serve the people. And I'm very proud, Dr. Moza uh, Suwaylah was there, Dr. Amina, Ustad Amina Abdullah, they were all there to provide the service. This shaped us and we had the national committee where a nurse was represented on the national committee in Bahrain to be handling the emergencies of the war that we were going through. Loads of lessons learned. I'm coming towards my last three slides. The principles that shaped always the working and it will shape us. The importance of working partnership that is working together on common objectives, 
shared values, acting collaboratively and supporting each other's efforts and building on each other's expertise. Nurses, midwives, physicians, nursing students, medical students, pharmacists, social, and at the same time nowadays I'm engaging journalists, veterinarians, and everyone. Relevance, developing health services and systems that is guided by health needs, evidence, and strategic priorities, engaging of the communities and population. Ownership, if we are not owning it, we will not walk it. We will not translate it. So adapting flexible approaches based on science and scientific uh, solutions, including digitalization nowadays, to lead by national authorities and implement with local env environment. I always put ethical action. This was guiding us uh, colleagues very early on who are hearing me, but it brought I brought it to the region and global planning and providing based on equity and fairness. How many times we are hearing equity and fairness these days? especially with COVID-19 when it comes to COVID-19 to the COVID vaccination. Why I'm saying this? This was actually in the 2002 global strategy, equity and fairness and respect of gender and human rights issues and mutual accountability. So we are joint accountable. Lessons learned, always uh, going from local to global. One thing that in the local, we need to always know what's happening, read the newspaper, discuss with the, each other, timely use of the information, share the knowledge because you will become more powerful, becoming proactive, creating core of informed team members who can disseminate the information, what I call critical mass and domino effect, negotiation skills and team building. Trust and confidence are very important, especially these days in our culture and what's happening in our region, that we do need to build the trust, especially for our mental health. Delegation of authority, I was privileged Many of us in Bahrain, nurses, during our time, at least when I was there, we were very privileged, and including today what I'm hearing from my colleagues, that authorities trusted the young ones and given them the solution to, to move and the, and the conducive environment. Accounting on nurses and friends of nursing, much larger. I have been very privileged that my medical colleagues, my, uh, uh, you know, the social colleagues have been always supporting and mobilizing, including working on the civil society. The space for innovation and creativity have been there. I am very proud that we were given in Bahrain a chance very early on to digitalize health, what they, those days it was called health information system and costing center. Costing center, we needed to know what are we spending on the health today. This is the key. There is a special envoy for sustainable development financing, financing to the UN Secretary General. I learned this in my country before I moved to the international, and that's why I say local to global. So we had government and leaders who were very forward and visionary. Way forward, our solidarity is important. Today, COVID-19 demonstrated that health security matters. No one is safe until all of us are safe. Investment in health is critical. It's also demonstrated. Investing in multidisciplinary teams, work and research and innovation. Investing in nurses and midwives. They are the pillars and evidence is showing more and more with this magnet or not and care for carers. Let's walk the talk to implement decisions. It might seem it's too much of blah, blah, blah. No, we have evidence to show. And uh, Dr. Kariba last week shared, if anybody's interested, they can go and lis listen to her also. Investment by government in human capital pays off. Whatever government of Bahrain invested in us, the nurses, the physicians, the healthcare workers, the teachers, today has paid off that we are at different in the region and the, and the global. Uh, private sector to contribute, including people. I come very strongly that as individuals, we are responsible and accountable, and that's part of the health security. Documenting best practices of collaboration and coordination effective from today, it is demonstrating a sustainable development goal 17, where Bahrain has already demonstrated, but we can also bring it to the region and globe. Call to protect health, humanity, capital, we position health concern over economic interest and safe green industry. Today, we are talking about COP27, so a lot of diplomacy is needed by everyone. I didn't dwell on the details of every single milestone. However, I want to stop here and give opportunity. I hope everybody heard me and that why my voice was OK, but I want to say that there are many people I did not recognize. This is during every nursing stop because Dr. Fariba last week, she recognized each one of them who has shaped our thinking 
and our uh, behavior to take the, to the globe what we are breathing from our country. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gazair. Um, there are no questions, so I'm going to just ask you one question, which I think um, I hope is relevant, but it's just uh, you've given us so much detail. I got a bit um, bit lost in the in the detail uh, because of the quantity, but uh, and a very important question from my perception as an outsider is if you are involved at this level, high level of regulation of teaching and training of nurses and midwives and funding for it, how do you actually regulate the distribution of funds to places like Afghanistan or uh, Iraq when it comes to funding uh, the training of nurses and so on. Who regulates it and how do you know that the money you have, the, you have WHO, the World Health Organization has it, uh, has distributed towards that type of education? How do you know that it's actually used for that and, not st and that is not actually, you know, um, uh, just siphoned off by politicians to do, to buy fast cars and big yachts and so on? Because it's, to me, one of the great problems about charity funding from the West and for nursing funding and medical funding in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, when the money is put through charities and big organizations, is that it actually gets lost in the, it just gets lost. It doesn't, each, it doesn't reach the proper consumer. So how do you regulate that? Do you do it personally or is there a WHO specific department that regulates the distribution of funds? Because that's the big question really, in my opinion. Thank you for the question. You are opening up. I handled Iraq between 2003 until 2010. And in Iraq, a lot of investment was made. Yeah. And all the donors gave. And I was the WHO representative and at the same time coordinating all the humanitarian United Nations, INGOs and everyone and presenting to the donor every year right. on what are we doing with the health sector. Okay. What the lessons learned then that the donor, the contributor and the UN and the World Bank established a very systematic accountability framework on every single penny where it goes. OK, came huge with the national engagement. So this is one. So I'm not talking about nurses and midwives only. It's about the whole health sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of it is the capacity building and part of the capacity building. If we take only the nurses and the same we did in Sudan, Last before I came to, G to G Egypt, what we did, we usually have within that capacity building, there is a, in, is, in it is for the regulation, is for the education, for the research. Your question, what are the accountability mechanisms put in place that the distribution is fairly to invest in the different uh, healthcare providers, especially in our region for nurses and midwives, because it goes usually to, the, to go to them very minimal. And this is something that continuously the WHO is presenting evidence to the government. For us, we are the secretariat and many people do not know this. When we talk World Health Organization, World Health Organizations, the governing body are the member states. This is one of the federal organization. I think I would like to give this information very critical. We are the only United Nations that is federal organization. That means the elected director general by the government and elected six regional directors by the government's constituency. What does it mean that the governments are questioning where every, everything and there is a whole accountability framework that has gone more into admin and finance and nitty gritties instead of looking at what are the technical and what are the health protection outcomes is coming. To question so what, about what is so going what, on in Afghanistan. So, so, yeah. So what, what percentage of the money is actually wasted, in my opinion, on administration and distributors who are commercial companies rather than actually getting at the uh, getting down to the to, to supplying the hospitals with uh, medicines to supply nursing staff to medical staff and so on. So uh, I saw a figure a number of years ago or something like only a third of the money coming through charities from the Irish Republic and other countries in Europe actually reaches uh, designated the designated institutions that two thirds of is actually siphoned off by, believe it or not, businessmen who actually exploit charity. So this is not particularly governments buying arms. This is actually businessmen siphoning off money that is actually designated for people who are poor, deprived, who do poor health services. They're actually making a profit of the whole idea of charity and all that. So how do you actually protect against that from in your from in the role you play? How do you protect against that? 
uh, how role, the role that I'm personally play, uh, playing, that I usually bring the spurness question and be loud. I already said that we need to be candid. Now, there are, there is, it is interwined, is the government's engagement, if I take Iraq, for example, and then yeah. I take Sudan, the donor request, we, they put a condition, we want this to go to this and this and this. So it's not the secretaries, it's the big donors, and this mm. is a big lesson learned from the experiences of what's happening. I totally agree with you that the humanitarian community, whether we are UN, whether INGO, whether we are private sector, there has been a lot of morality that needs to be values to be bringing back instead yeah. of than looking into the very narrow uh, uh, profit that's making. This is something that the governments, and again, I want to say, the member states are the ones to actually really respond and hold accountable. Then yeah. this brings the whole monitoring and evaluation. If you go to the Iraq Trust Fund, and that's something I'm bringing back again to my organization and to everyone. Last year, last week, I mentioned it to all the UN that if we look at there, there was a very clear, detailed, every single penny where it goes. The web, line, web link is there. It's called Iraq Trust Fund and it's okay. multilateral. And you knew that every single penny, but when it came, for example, for healthcare professionals, what went for nursing, what went for physicians? Your question is a challenge that we continue need to raise the voice to bring the whistle and do the studies. If it was 35%, I can tell you my first three years in Iraq by certain entities that put large billion dollars, 90% went out. And okay, it's All right, so, so it, 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 it has been actually uh, policed by, by people like you. So thank you very much. We'll move on because we're running out of time. So our next speak, thank God, that was a very good talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Gazir. Our next talk, our next speaker is um, from the Emerald Isle, like myself, uh, uh, is very well educated and very erudite. Um, she did a medical degree in Dublin, in University College Dublin in 1989. And her present role is as a lecturer in healthcare ethics in, in the RCSI College of Medicine in Bahrain. Um, in uh, her academic background is uh, outstanding in that she has got a master's degree in pharmacology and taught uh, in the pharmacology department of the RCSI. And then in 2007 and 12, she did a, a law degree and a PhD in medical jurisprudence at the University of Manchester, where I myself am actually doing exactly the same thing, but in uh, chemistry rather than in medical jurisprudence. She's taught in uh, ethics and law in the Dublin City University and is joined our, our wonderful institution in Bahrain in 2021. Uh, her topics of discussion uh, I absolutely fascinated by. Uh, she's got, um, uh, Fanula has got a much more erudite background than I have in this area, but I have some uh, basic knowledge of some of the concepts she's going to talk about today and hopefully I'll be able to ask one or two decent questions. So uh, Fanula, I'll hand over to you uh, and I'm so grateful that you have actually um, uh, contribute. You are going to contribute a wonderful talk to us today. So uh, the only thing I would suggest, Vanula, is it's 4:55 now, and if you could try and finish by uh, 4 uh, 5:40, if you don't mind, 5:45 at the end. So that gives you three quarters of an hour to 50 minutes, and because I want to have some time to ask you some questions at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that introduction, John, and um, thank you, uh, Dr. El Gassir, for a very interesting talk going from the local to the international. Um, I'm afraid uh, I, this will be a much more uh, lowbrow talk in comparison. So what I want to talk about is a topic I've been interested in of um, research misconduct. And, um, it, and as the series is on history, um, placing ethics in history is always very important because it gives us a perspective on it. And ethics helps us to explain the historical problems people were trying to solve. And as we all know, those who fail to study history are, are condemned to repeat it. So why is ethics in research, my topic today, important? So we all know that over the last couple of hundred years, science and technology has significantly improved uh, quality and length of human life. And we owe our present standard of living to the huge amount of uh, research that has made this possible. Large numbers of, of lives have been um, saved by advances 
in, uh, in medicine and particularly in basic things like nutrition and hydration and um, improvement in our uh, living environment has significantly improved life, life expectancy and a lot of this improvement has been due to scientific research and research as with all human activities is governed by individual community and social values and ethical thought has helped to shape the regulations around which scientific research has taken place. But ethics should and does go beyond what the regulations require asking what ought we to do and what is the right thing to do. And one of the uh, things that we need to do when we want to talk about mi research misconduct is first to be able to actually define it. And um, one of the things that we need to look at is one of the unanswered questions in research misconduct is actually how often does it happen and this will actually depend on how it's um, how it's defined so there's two definitions that are commonly used the us definition and the uk and nordic countries one the us definition is quite specific it says there is there is a significant departure from accepted practices of the relevant research community the miscock the misconduct must be committed intentionally, knowingly or recklessly, and the allegations must be proved or proven by a preponderance of evidence. The UK has a broader definition. Um, it's a serious definition from accepted research practices in proposing a carrying out or reporting research. So we all are probably familiar with this picture of Edward Jenner inoculating James Fipp, who was the nine year old son of his um, gardener. And although this um, process of vaccination has, and has been particularly important over the last couple of years, it was a real uh, breakthrough in scientific research. There was this was probably an example, one of the earlier examples of research misconduct, because there certainly was no informed consent on either the behalf of the child involved or his parents. This is a slide that some of you may be familiar with, the, the scientist Albert Neiser. Um, and um, although STDs, um, as we all are um, probably aware, have been with humanity since time immemorial, it's really over in the last 70 years that there's actually been any effective treatment for them. And through the European uh, Renaissance, right through to the 19th century, doctors used very toxic treatments to try and um, treat STDs. They used mercury and they used arsenic, um, both for syphilis and gonorrhea. And some of the kind of well-known sufferers of these maladies would have been people like Oscar Wilde, Beethoven, Schubert, uh, Vincent van Gogh, and even um, Abraham Lincoln, the well-known uh, American president. And it was back in 1879 that the uh, Albert Niger discovered actually the gonococcus bacterium and this, this identified it as the cause of gonococcus. In, later on in 1898, he tried to develop um, a syphilis vaccine. And what he did was he took serum from patients with syphilis and uh, who were in the hospital admitted for other reasons and injected them um, into other patients without informing them of the experiment or seeking informed consent from them. And when they subsequently contracted syphilis, he concluded that the vaccination, uh, his process of vaccination has failed and he had failed to produce a vaccination for syphilis. Ministry in Prussia, where he was working at the time, became aware of this and issued a directive, one of the very first directives regarding non-therapeutic research. And it said that all such research must have an unambiguous um, consent. And this, this uh, directive that they issued was followed in the 1930s by the G German Minister for the Interior issuing guidelines on new therapies and human experimentation, which emphasised the necessity for seeking informed consent, particularly again in non-therapeutic research. In fact, as I mentioned to you before last year, this was the law that was actually binding during the Third Reich. So syphilis is, has been well known through uh, the course of humanity. And again, a lot of you will be more familiar than, than, than me with the, the symptoms of syphilis. So the primary is a, is a non-tender um, uh, lesion that's known as a chancre and it's often on the genitalia. Then there, be, there come plant, palmar and plantar lesions, fever, fatigue, hair loss, aching joints and a rash that's quite often on the back and on the torso are all classical symptoms of syphilis. This is the actual spirochete that um, is involved in um, the production or that causes the disease and it's known as treponium um, pallidum. And this was actually discovered back in 1905 and a test for diagnosing it in 1906. 
The discovery of the of the causative agent and of a diagnostic test um, paved the way for a more focused attention on addressing the presence of these specific microbes in infected patients. And it was in 1909 that Paul Ehrlich, famous chemist, announced an arsenic-based compound, Salversan, that was uh, presenting as a or promising new treatment for syphilis. And like the earlier medicines, it didn't really cure syphilis, but it actually reduced the infective rate. And it meant that patients who suffered from it were less likely to infect others. So research into STDs in the early part of the 20th century was really in, important and it was particularly important to those that were involved in the military or the war efforts at the time because um, because of the potential of these diseases to affect military activity. In fact, before World War I, um, uh, an expert uh, that worked for the military in the area of these diseases noted that there's not one factor or condition in the army which produces more sickness decreases the efficiency of men so greatly or affects their morale more than diseases of venereal origin. In fact, it has been argued that historically no disease had proven as debilitating to military efforts as those transmitted in sexual contact and no disease as strikingly ignored. And in fact, during the American Civil War, it was estimated that 20% of those fighting had acquired infections and the rates increased even further during the Spanish-American War of 1898. But with the development of a pseudo imperialistic foreign policy that the American troops were now sent to various other countries, particularly in Latin America, the number of infections in the American army between 1908 and 1910 increased yet again. And during this period, the, the admission rate in American military hospitals for VD equaled the com combined admission for the next five most frequently experienced illnesses in, in soldiers. So as the cost of treating VDs became uh, ever greater, both public health and military officials sought to address these problems and uh, bringing into the open a previously uh, secret medical issue. And in fact, in 1910, the Surgeon General of the United States outlined the gravity of the situation, saying that the venereal peril has come to outweigh in importance any other sanitary question which now confronts the army, and neither our national optimism nor the Anglo-Saxon disposition to ignore a subject which is offensive to public prudery can no longer excuse a frank and honest confrontation of the problem. So the Public Health uh, Service in the United States was charged with trying to develop a policy to treat and venereal diseases. But despite the efforts, it was reported in the American um, expeditionary forces in World War I, syphilis and gonorrhea, in fact, were a worse enemy, worse enemy than the German army. Um, an article published in Life magazine outlined the kind of figures involved that the venereal uh, cases in the fighting forces outnumbered the total casualties dead, wounded or missing by nearly 160,000. Some 400,000 men were laid up for nearly seven and a half million uh, military days effectively. So it's easy to see why uh, the army regarded syphilis as, as a dangerous saboteur and why medical and uh, military officers in particular were saying that a diseased prostitute receiving upwards of three dozen clients a night can do more damage than a 500 pine bomb dropped squarely in the middle of an army camp. And this is a letter that came from um, Dr. Jay Moore, who at the time was um, the chairman of the subcommittee on venereal diseases, about the importance of the problem to the armed forces. It's a little bit difficult to read, but I can read it out for you. What he said was the current incidence of fresh infections from gonorrhea in the US Army and Navy is roughly 35 per, hun per thousand strength of the uh, per annum and the publicly announced strength of the army, including Marines, for 1943 is in excess of 10 million. And if the president's present incidence of gonorrhea can't not be materially reduced, and in fact, if it even doesn't rise, which what would be anticipated for personnel serving abroad, there will be during 1943 and during each subsequent year, approximately 350,000 fresh infections and assuming an average loss of time of 20 days per infection per man, this would this would put a count for 7 million lost man army days, the equivalent of putting out of action for a full year, an entire strength of two full 
army divisions of aircraft carriers. So significant impact on the ability of uh, the army to actually to have a, a, a fighting force that was significantly uh, ready and not crippled by disease. So when they actually set up venereal disease camps and you can see this was one that was set up during the First World War. And they started um, trying to analyze where uh, the rates of infection increase. So you can see that during wars in general, the rates of venereal diseases um, went up and down. So the army identified um, VD, as I said, as a worse enemy, in fact, at times than Germans. And they started publishing uh, different uh, posters like that one um, to say, you know, to um, try and get their men not to uh, engage in activities that was going to lead to them contracting um, VD. And this is an interesting picture to show that the Irish Army actually wasn't a lot better in this area. This is from the early 1940s or 1920s, sorry, from the Portobello barracks, which was particularly ravaged by outbreaks of STIs in the 1920s. And records that were recently released by the Army uh, uh, Military Archive showed that gonorrhea and syphilis among troops had reached, in fact, a crisis level by 1924, just after the War of Independence. And apologies in advance to anybody who may have actually come from Bray when this is a quote from a Lieutenant Murphy of the Irish Army's um, Marshal Staff said that, in my opinion, seven out of every ten of Bray's girls are of ill repute. And this was during a routine inspection of the seaside town in late 1923. And what is interesting in the Irish Army's context that in order to try and reduce the number of STDs, Irish soldiers had a quarter of their pay docked for every day that they were sick and received treatment with uh, an STD. So given this kind of background and its impact on um, military um, function and on society as a whole, syphilis became a prominent area of research with many um, uh, articles published by the Public Health uh, Services Journal of Venereal Diseases, which became a very widely circulated uh, government publication um, in the early part of the 20th century and, in, and into the 1930s. And in fact, 1938, the Surgeon General um, Thomas Parron of the US testified before Congress in support of proposed legislation to expand the funding for public health prevention efforts on scientific research in this particular field. He said there was a requirement um, in effect for men and munitions in the battle against syphilis and other STDs. And he sought funding to um, complete the public health uh, services study to investigate and demonstrate what is necessary to prevent and also to treat in a more effective way these particular maladies. So in 1938 in the United States, the Venereal Disease Act was passed with the objective of ripe, wiping out syphilis into, uh, for the next generation. And it was in this context that the now famous Tuskegee um, study took place. These are some of the posters that the PHS produced. And you can see there is a slight emphasis on the role of women in providing or being the, the vectors for um, for the disease and maybe uh, there's an overemphasis on women's um, in fact of all the, the posters that I looked at to, to that uh, that were produced by the PHS there's only one and this is the one that actually advises women to sorry to stay away from men Sorry, and you can see um, there it's, it's basically it was saying that that soldiers who go to dance halls are most likely um, to be carriers of this of this of these conditions. So this leads me on to Tuskegee, which uh, again a lot of you will probably be familiar as one of the uh, one of the most egregious uh, abuses of research um, uh, ethics that has taken place in the United States. Um, and the official title of this was the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro man, male, and it began in 1932 while all this um, hand wringing and, and fund searching was going on uh, to try and find up to find a solution for uh, the, the rampant nature of syphilis and um, gonorrhea throughout the United States, but particularly in the armies. 
What happened in uh, Tuskegee were, was that a, about 600 men were enrolled. They were attracted by advertisements such as this um, saying, do you have by bad blood? And it was aimed particularly at uh, poor American, African-American sharecroppers. So there were 399 in the experimental group who were initially diagnosed with syphilis and there were 201 in the control group who um, at the beginning of the experiment didn't have syphilis. Most of the men who came forward were poor and illiterate and lived in the local community. And in this community, syphilis was seen as a significant health uh, concern. It had a prevalence of 35% in those of reproductive age. And as um, mentioned earlier, the treatments of mercury and bismuth were you were very aggressive and very um, uncomfortable and difficult treatments for syphilis, but the cure rate was also uh, poor. It was less than 30 percent. Treatments required months to complete. People couldn't work sometimes when they were having the treatment and side effects were extremely toxic. So and even occasionally fatal. So people um, were keen to be treated for what they what they identified as having bad blood. And these are some of the slides um, from uh, this particular uh, nurse known as Nurse Eunice Rivers, who was one of those who actually recruited a lot um, of, the, of the men who took part in the study, encouraging them by saying that they would get treatment for fatigue and anemia and that their other um, medical conditions would be looked after. And in fact, they were, but they just didn't ever treat them for um, the syphilis that they had if, if it was identified early on. And um, they never actually explained to the men uh, what they were actually going to be, um, what the actual experiment was or the, the research was into. They just said that they were going to keep an eye on their health in general. And they encouraged them by uh, saying that they would receive free medical exams, that they would get free meals each time they came up to the clinic to be examined. They would get treatment for minor uh, injuries and that they would receive um, a burial insurance for their families. So you can see, I mean, this goes without saying this, this incentivization was effectively coercion uh, because this was far and above anything that was available for most um, African-American people at this time. And this is, um, this is a, 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 a screenshot from a documentary uh, that um, showed or that basically was took place in researching into Tuskegee um, uh, and, and identified that it should sorry, it should have finished uh, way back and um, within a couple of years of it actually starting because uh, penicillin became available and became the standard treatment for syphilis but the scientists in Tuskegee continued to withhold penicillin treatment for the participants and it wasn't until until a 1972 uh, press leak that actually the, the, um, the study was halted despite the fact that it initially it was only supposed to have lasted for six months um, and it, it actually went on for 40 years and ultimately uh, a number of people died of syphilis, partners, wives and even children were affected by congenital syphilis. The initial intention of the study was to report on the natural history of syphilis in the untreated, um, um, the untreated patient uh, in the hopes of justifying treatment programs, particularly uh, for African Americans. But the results revealed that really they were no further on in, in um, and identify the, everything that they knew about the, the physiology and the um, pathophysiology of syphilis was known. They didn't find any difference in the African-American population versus that which they already knew in the white population. And really the risk um, under um, taken by the participants far outweighed any benefit that was um, actually accrued from this research study. So as I said back in 1972 then, the, uh, the fact that this research had been going on for almost 40 years finally hit the, hit the press and as a result um, from an actual public health service employee who had been trying to 
get the project stopped for uh, a number of years and eventually went to, went to the press um, in frustration at trying to get someone within the department to actually listen to him. And this unleashed international public outcry, outcry and resulted in several actions by US federal agencies. The Secretary of State for Health and Scientific Affairs appointed an ad hoc advisory committee to review the study and they produced um, this report, the Belmont report, which determined that the study was ethically unjustified. And then a month later, um, the, the, the study was ended. And this Belmont report, um, as you're probably well aware, became a seminal uh, document um, into uh, research ethics and how uh, research really should be um, conducted, um, particularly in the States, but it ha has also influenced um, research ethic regulations in, in other jurisdictions. Um, on behalf of the people who were involved in the study, a class action suit was initiated um, on behalf of the men, on behalf of their wives, on behalf of their children. And the settlement gave more than 90 million uh, to the, 9 million, sorry, to the participants. And as part of the settlement, the US government promised to provide a range of free service to the survivors of the study and their families. They were all offered free medical and burial services that would be uh, ultimately administered uh, by the CDC, who uh, again, who have been very prominent over the last couple of years in the pandemic. But one of the most important things that came out of the Belmont report, and, and this is an example uh, of Bill Clinton, who apologised to one of the remaining survivors of the Anna Herman Shaw, 95 year old survivor of the Tuskegee experiment, was that uh, it was identifiable that syphilis was now curable and that the, the treatment shouldn't have been withheld from them. And in fact, uh, once syphilis or once uh, it was found that um, penicillin should or could treat syphilis. And as you can see down here, um, this is a letter from um, a doctor who was writing to um, Dr. Eagle in the public health service that he said to prove that syphilis um, could be treated by uh, penicillin, it would have to be injected into human bodies and that they, the experiments that they had been doing up to that, uh, injecting it into rabbits, what weren't really adequate. Um, but as you, if you read the last sentence, it said, since this is ethically impossible, it may take years for us to gather the information needed. But um, as I'll go on to talk to you about in a minute, we'll see that the. Uh, the, the idea of injecting syphilis germs into human bodies um, was one that the public health service took forward in another jurisdiction. But what I want to just mention in relation to uh, the apology and the, the examining Tuskegee and the Belmont report was that the Belmont report identified three really important principles and um, the principle of respect for persons, beneficence and justice. And we can see, or hopefully you can see that from the unethical treatment of the men in this Tuskegee syphilis study, that these three ethical principles were, were violated, um, you know, to, to an extreme extent. Certainly, if you look at respect for persons, there was absolutely no autonomy in that the men were and uh, weren't told what the study was about. They were, weren't formally consented. Their participation um, was just expected it they um they didn't uh have you know the adequate information to actually make fully informed consent whether they would have understood it um completely or not is, is irrelevant um, and one of the things that the belmont report called for and um, was that adequate information awareness of comprehension and voluntariness um, of participation in research are key components of informed consent and should always, um, you know, should always be there. Respect for persons also um, is essential part of confidentiality and privacy, and there was very little of that in relation to the, the researchers talked openly about the, the different participants. And um, one of the other things in the Belmont report um, advocated was the right to withdraw from um, any kind of research. And um, this again, this option was never given to the participants. Um, so the participants autonomy was really disregarded. One of the second elements that the Belmont report um, advocates or lauds is beneficence. And beneficence 
um, always requires that the risk benefit ratio of the research should be appropriate. In other words, the benefits should outweigh the risks involved and that if there are risks that steps are taken to mitigate those risks. The participants of the Tuskegee study were unduly influenced by the offer of free medical care given their economic circumstances and they, 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 that kind of care wouldn't have been available to them um, if they hadn't participated in the research. And as described by the advisory committee that looked into uh, the whole um, study, the crucial me measure of benefit outweighing risk to participants was never met in the entire 40 years of the study. In other words, the knowledge gained by the study didn't in, under any circumstances outweigh the risks that was, were experienced by the participants. And the last, um, the last ethical um, principle that the Belmont report highlights is that of justice. And justice is possibly the more, most difficult of the, the principles to, to grasp within the Belmont report, in that justice can mean you know, many things to many different people. And, but in terms of justice in relation to this Belmont report, syphilis was identified as a widespread health, health problem and a health crisis for all citizens of the United States. And yet it was only poor um, African-Americans that were asked to participate in it white men were never asked to enroll in the study. And secondly, justice can um, pertain to distributive justice in that when um, something or, or uh, a resource or a treatment becomes available, then it should be given to all that needed. But the participants in the study were never offered um, penicillin to cure their syphilis. Um, so you can see that as well, justice was never, um, never served um, within this study. So this is why this particular um, cartoon is, is particularly important and, and shows you how much damage was done by the Tuskegee study. So I'll go on to. So this leads us up to the last um, slide showed you that uh, the doctors within the public health service were aware that it wasn't going to be possible to actually determine how much uh, penicillin could act um, as a prophylactic against syphilis or how much penicillin would actually be needed to adequately treat an active infection of syphilis unless the syphilis could be injected directly into the human body and as this letter shows this should be considered ethically impossible but according to some um, researchers in the public health service this was something that they were willing to consider. And this is Dr. Cutler, and he was um, a, a quite high ranking doctor in the public health service um, in the United States. And he uh, participated in another egregious um, abuse of medical research. Um, and this was uh, one that took place in Guatemala. The extent of the Guatemalan um, research misconduct was um, unearthed by this, this lady, a Dr. Reverie, and she's a historian. And what she was actually looking into Dr. Cutler's papers in, rela in relation to Tusk EG, and she came across writings and letters of his that um, covered a period from 1946 to 1948. Um, and she realized very quickly that this would possibly represented an even bigger scandal um, than um, Tuskegee even. And what uh, what she found out was that the public health service had gone to um, another country outside of the United States to do their next bit of research because that would involve them doing something that wouldn't have been permitted within the boundaries um, of, uh, of the United States. So what did they do? They went to a very small country in Latin America and this was Guatemala, a very poor Latin American country, and they started um, uh, carrying out some research there. And once Dr. Reverie had identified uh, the problem, uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping a little bit at uh, time wise from 1946, but it was back in 2010 that when she had un unearthed this information, that President Obama instructed a presidential commission for the study of bioethical issues to inquire into this research that had taken place. And these studies um, entailed the deliberate inoculation of unconsenting prisoners, mental asylum patients and soldiers with venereal disease 
both syphilis and gonorrhea. There was evidence of deception and secrecy. The, Dr. Cutler had written in one of his letters that it would be wise not to let um, the information about his studies became, become widely known, even within the public health service, and not to, um, not to publish anything about it. And um, the Commission, when it determined on the research um, that had taken place in Guatemala, it decided that, uh, that the research, or described the research as heinous, uh, egregious, unconscionable and justifiable, and identified those responsible as being morally blameworthy. A press release from the Commission following, following the submission of the reports stated that researchers knowingly violated ethical boundaries when they intentionally infected Guatemalan prisoners, mental health patients and prostitutes. One of the reasons that the research went to Guatemala in 1946 was that prostitution was actually legal in Guatemala at the time. And um, this allowed them to directly um, introduce infection into um, live human subjects. The report's conclusion articulated a particularly negative moral view of the research, finding to a shocking degree actions undertaken as part of the Guatemalan experiments unjustifiable and often, and often grossly violated the shared basic sense of human decency encoded in the principal elements of moral life, and that many of the actions performed as part of the project were uh, morally blameworthy, and that they, even at the time, they um, involve gross ethical violations, you know, judging them even in terms of the ethics that were um, uh, standard in 1946 and not just necessarily comparing them to the kind of level of ethical standards that we would accept today. So that the, the it was, they find that even it went against the, the researchers own sense of medical ethic practices and requirements that they were familiar with. So when viewed from the perspective of the protections offered to research subjects today, the activities of these researchers would be identified as being profoundly unethical. One of the big issues with it was that it was identified that none of the participants formally consented. Many, if not all of the participants were harmed, some of them grievously so, and, um, and of the 100 or 1,308 people involved in the research, um, 687 were documented um, as being treated to some extent, but not completely. Um, of these, uh, a number died, and the age of the people that were um, took part in this ranged from as young as 10 up to 72. These are some. Uh, these are examples of some of the psychiatric patients who um, took part in the uh, initial studies. The plan had been to go to the prisons in Guatemala and to, um, because again, because prostitution was legal, to allow the prisoners to have intercourse with uh, paid prostitutes who were either naturally infected or who were infected by the researchers introducing um, gonorrhea or syphilis directly um, onto their cervix or within their vagina. But there were problems with the initial phase. The prisoners um, didn't like having their blood tested before and after because they wanted to see if they were free of infection prior to exposure from the prostitutes and then contracted infection after exposure. And then the prostitutes didn't always turn up when they were supposed to be. So neither the prisoners nor the prostitutes unsurprisingly acted as perfect laboratory specimens. Um, the inducements for the prisoners weren't considered to be strong enough to, to, um, for them to continue to allow this to take place. And as, um, as I mentioned before, there was no evidence of any um, informed consent from either the prostitutes or the prisoners. So what the researchers then did, they moved on to another vulnerable population. So that's why they ended up in the psychiatric hospital. So the technique of sexual exposure uh, to the infections wasn't possible in the asylum. So they cho chose to inoculate patients with infective material on their forearm, on their face, or on the mouth of women after an abrasion was um, put onto their skin or on the abraded penises of the men. Other methods of infection that were also tried were the ingestion of syphilitic tissue mixed with distilled water, the removal of spinal fluid that was then infused um, with syphilitic material and then reintroduced into the spine or the venous injection of these mixtures.
This is an example of a syphilitic rash on one of the um, psychiatric patients. And of note, she was only 22 years um, old at the time. And there is a there is a quote from the uh, from the report that's particularly disturbing about one of the patients that that is nominally called Berta in the psychiatric hospital um, in 1948. She was injected in her left arm with syphilis. A month later, she developed scabies. Several weeks later, Dr. Cutler noted that she had developed red lumps where he had injected her arm, lesions on her arms and legs, and that that her skin was beginning to waste away from her body. Berta, however, wasn't treated for her syphilis until about three months after her initial injection. Dr. Cutler wrote in his notes in August that Berta appeared as if she was going to die, but he didn't specify why. The same day after having noted that she was that he thought she was going to die, he still put gonorrheal pus from a male subject into both of her eyes, as well as her urethra and her rectum. He reinfected her in addition with more syphilis. Several days later, when Berta's eyes were full of gonorrheal pus and she was bleeding from her urethra, she died. So you can see again more of these, um, sorry, more of the psychiatric patients. This is a picture of um, of a particular elderly Guatemalan um, known as Frederico Ramos. Another uh, of the vulnerable populations that the researchers sought out were soldiers. Um, they permitted Guatemalan soldiers again to have uh, intercourse with uninfected prostitutes and then to have a syphilitic inoculum inserted into the meatus of their penis. This, uh, this 92-year-old man in this picture, Frederico, was one such soldier and he's seen here with his 67-year-old son who um, it turned out actually had contracted syphilis congenitally. Frederico was in the Guatemalan army from 1948 to 50 and one afternoon he was preparing for weekend leave when he was ordered to attend a US clinic. When he attended the clinic, he was injected into, he was injected with an unknown substance into his right arm and the doctor told him to come back when his leave was over and the Guatemalan commander handed him money and, and told him just to go to go on with him. Ramos, over the next number of decades, experienced numerous unexplained health issues until and he was in his early 20s when this happened and it was only in his mid 40s he was finally diagnosed with syphilis and gonorrhea and not only did he test positive but his wife and children were also infected with syphilis this is a picture of a, a woman an elderly woman who as, as you can see has the classic saddle nose of someone who has inherited um, syphilis from her um, from her mother through a congenital infection so as I said, of the um, of the the um, the patients, a number of them were um, quite badly treated. So you can see this is a timeline that shows where um, the the experiments in Guatemala took place. So back in February of 1946, the um, the national Institute of Health recommended the syphilitic study studies to take place in Guatemala, and then John Cutler arrived. Um, in February of 1947, there was the first intentional exposure experiments with the Guatemalan army. Um, then after exposure through sex workers didn't work, Cutler applied disease material directly to his research subjects. And then in August 1947, he started using abrasions to increase the infection rate. Then he was informed by um, another person within the public health service that the experiments were drastic and he was instructed then in September of 1948 to wind the experiments down and in fact he left Guatemala in 1948. And all this basically disappeared into um, the ether for you know for a, a long period of time nearly 60 years until Susan Reverie discovered the records through his diaries and through his um, writings documenting these experiments she brought them to light and presented her findings to the American Association for History of Medicine and then Barack Obama basically issued a, a public apology to to President Alviro Colmon of Guatemala apologizing for the medical research and then lawsuits, as um, uh, as with Tuskegee, lawsuits then resulted. And 
Unfortunately, in June of 2012, the judge dismissed the suit against the United States because apparently the United States has indemnity against any action of it, uh, the state or by its um, soldiers or by statesmen outside of the actual borders of the United States, which again was probably one of the reasons that they went to Guatemala. So in an attempt to get some money for the Guatemalan um, uh, participants uh, or victims, we should say, there was a lawsuit instituted against John Hopkins University and against the foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, which had sponsored some of the money and um, one of the pharmaceutical companies, Bristol Myers Squibbs, that, um, that had uh, also been involved. And this is a very unhappy looking President Obama apologising to Professor, um, President Como of, um, of Guatemala. And in addition, the, um, the uh, Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State and um, Human Services Secretary Catherine Sibelius had to apologise to the Guatemalan um, public. Um, Kath Kathleen Sibelius instituted another study, another presidential commission for the study of bioethical issues into um, this whole uh, egregious uh, incident in, in Guatemala and it was entitled Ethically Impossible. And basically the commission under the chairmanship of Amy Gutmann found that that the research performed in Guatemala um, was it was known at the time that they couldn't have taken place in the United States. In fact, some of the people involved stated explicitly that we couldn't do this in our own country. It was seen as a foreign population that was ethically, ethnically, racially, nationally different and not valuable. The effect was that the people of Guatemala were commodified. And the Commission came to the conclusion that of the, of, the, of the 1,308 people who took part in this study, that there were 83 direct deaths that were directly attributable to the Guatemalan study. So this is the actual study from the President Commission, and it's a hard read, I can tell you. So what um, I'd like to just um, make some concluding remarks is that you can note from the way that the people of Guatemala were treated, that the way the people of Tuskegee were treated, that they were effectively commodified. And the, the sociologist Jean Kingborn has said that turning a human being into a thing is almost always the first step towards justifying violence against that person. And what I'd like to say that if science you know, isn't to uh, repeat these kind of um, this kind of misconduct. It's essential that science is practiced um, in an ethically acceptable manner. And one of the problems um, in trying to reduce misconduct is that we need to uh, increase the overall level of scientific integrity, codes of good conduct rather than just listing off bad practices, and that we need to teach integrity. Um, we, you know, it's I mean, we're doing this as a, as a lecture series and, and throughout the curriculum in RCSI, um, ethics are emphasised and research ethics in particular are, are given a lot of precedence. So that we want to not just produce researchers that are aware that they're limited by regulations, but that they ought, that they um, have integrity in themselves. And this is particularly important when science is publicly funded because it must always be guarded, guided towards positive contributions to enhance the quality of human life. And on, on just on my last slide here, it's really important that um, that we raise the consciousness of our researchers to realise that they are you know, going to be constantly presented with ethical issues um, both in their clinical lives and in their research lives and that they have to you know, make themselves familiar with the important principles that go garner um, informed consent and that they analyse their data ethically and, uh, you know, a dozen other uh, ethical issues and that they must learn to um, accept that there's not going to be always a right answer or something they can just read out of a textbook, rather that they need to be able to think their way through their the, the complex issues that they're going to be presented with and hopefully reach um, an ethically defensible answer to the question so that it's always the presence of an intelligent, informed, conscientious, compassionate and responsible investigator that will be our best safeguard 
um, to producing ethical research. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, thank uh, you, Manuela. Uh, that that was excellent. 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 Very impressed. Um, uh, there are no questions, so uh, I um. I'm afraid I don't have the same background as you uh, in law and in ethics, so I have to ask you as a historian of some sort and maybe a clinician of some sort as well. I would just open, uh, make a two, couple of remarks first, which I run by. So this um, uh, last slide concurs very well with two very famous um, academics, uh, Hannah Arendt, who's a Jewish uh, philosopher who talked about the banality of evil, which talked about the Nazi behavior, the behavior of the Nazi regime in, in across the whole of Europe with the extermination of the Jews with Nazi experiments, medical experiments in Dachau. Uh, and it also applies to 731 in Japan, of course, the very famous medical experiments in Japan. And you're quite right, the commodification, the, the modif commodification of uh, the, the creation of a human being as a, as a, as a just a, a, an in, a non, non make, making humans non-human, making them an entity, make them just uh, is is what uh, is what Hannah Arendt is talking about. The lack of respect we have for uh, the individuals, and it it it, it um it, it's still happening. I mean, during the Serbian war, uh, during this war in Yugoslavia, a Serbian uh, was even a general got onto a bus of Muslim uh, farmers who, and he says there's a smell of the farmyard about this in this bus, implying the the poor Muslim farmers were less than human, and therefore when you can dehumanize people, you can then exploit them with a clear conscience, which is what uh, Hannah Arendt has always talked about. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, we still see it in, in attitudes towards the black uh, underclass in America. We see it um, with the, the Roma gypsies and even the gypsies in Ireland, you know, they are outside the, they're outside the mainstream of Irish society. They're demonized as being uh, you know, thieves and drug runners and so on and so forth, and they're very much isolated. And you see it in every society. You see it in Romanian society. You see it in Europe with the North Africans in Paris. You see it in Ireland with tinkers and the gypsies and so on. And um, uh, Edward Said, of course, has talked about this in uh, in Orientalism. He talks about this, uh, the other, that um, that it's very easy for the West to see the Orient or the Islamic world as being outside accepted accepted norms of culture and society and so on. And therefore, when you can do that, you can actually exploit them, as has happened when you go through history in the in the Middle East. Now, I'll ask you one question about your opinion of this. There was an article in the um, in the New England Journal of Medicine a number of years ago about the hypothermia experiments that were done in Dachau. So what they did was they got a lot of uh, they took some, I can't remember the exact numbers now, it's about 20 years since I read the article, but they got some uh, prisoners of war, new Poles and so on, and they actually sub sub subjected them to hypothermia experiments in water baths in Dachau in order to simulate what happens to pilots, particularly Nazi, particularly German pilots who get lost in the North Sea or in the British Channel when they're trying to bomb England. And the experiments then showed the physiological limitations or the, the physiological limits about survival and what you need to do for rewarming and also, also on and so forth. And these experiments, although highly unethical, produced very good results that you couldn't uh, repeat today in any physiology laboratory. And the, uh, the article in the New England Journal of Medicine was about when you have got, how do you actually treat or manage experimental results that are done unethically that produce a positive outcome or an educational outcome that allows us to use them to produce more experimental procedures to produce more knowledge and more outcomes that are beneficial to society. So you're basing your experimental research nowadays on unethical evidence achieved previously. What happens when you when you have that uh, dilemma on your hands? OK, thanks uh, for the question. Um, in particular, in relation to the hypothermic experiments, you cannot take the data as being valid because you, the data was being done on prisoners of war, people who had been kept in concentration camps, who had been underfed. They weren't being, you know, they were not consenting. So the actual data that I know it's been argued since the 1980s, since the, the Canadian experimenter in hypothermic experiments wanted to use it. Um, and I suppose the the just the justification for it 
would be we're never going to get this kind of data again but yeah, the data exactly. is valid because it wasn't done on people who were in the best of health to start with so they're they're not comparable research subjects for a start and the other way of looking at it and most ethicists would look at it said if you if you regard and particularly in relation to those studies that were done um, on data that was obtained during the the nazi area if you regard the data that was obtained as the same as being um, a bar of soap that was made from the rendered fat from jewish bodies how would you feel washing yourself? I mean, you'll still get clean using the bar of soap, but mm. will you feel clean? Mm. What, what do you think of, um, just, uh, I, what, what I can't, well, I, I could, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to mention the particular professor, but there is a very eminent professor of oncology who's been in trouble recently, which I'm sure you're aware of, uh, in a certain country in Europe, where he, uh, in his private practice, was treating terminally ill patients with high dose chemotherapy when their chances of survival were poor anyway. And he justified it on the grounds that these people came along and they were consenting. He was giving them full information about the limits and uh, and side effects of the drugs he was given, and they consented and agreed for the use of these drugs. There was loads of complaints then by the nursing staff in the particular hospitals he did the work in, and he was stopped three years ago. And he was brought in front of the GMC, and he's now been given and he's had a whole load of very eminent oncology professors in England um, supporting his behaviour. And um, and he has been given a nine month sentence, which I think has been far too lenient, but I'm not a, an, an expert in law or am I anyone to judge? But it would seem to me on the grounds of common sense that he definitely breached the limits of common sense and, and certainly morality and ethics when it comes to medical practice. But his justification Finula, is this they, they were consenting he he yeah. told them they were fully informed and yet he was um, admonished by the GMC because, because they were because they were desperate and people who are desperate aren't don't have full autonomy mm. you oh, mean yeah. you have to accept that and I think that the emphasis on autonomy in in ethics over the last 25 years has been warped I th think at times you have to you know you have to accept that people don't make the right choices and and to to, to say that someone who is terminally ill that knows they're terminally ill and knows this might be their last chance isn't desperate that that's being ridiculous yeah. you know that's that's not accepting the realities of of people's the stress that people are under when they're in those kind of situations they'd probably sign away their firstborn if they thought it might give them you know an extra yeah. uh, extra weeks of life so I would agree that, you know, even though he's justifying that he fully consented these people, I don't think they really could be regarded as having full autonomy on in the situation that they were in. So that's that's the position that I would take on it. OK, good. All right. Thank you. Finula. I, that was absolutely outstanding lecture. I'm so impressed. God bless you. It was really good. Uh, I think we leave it there. I have forced another meeting in 25 minutes. So uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. It was a really good session today. And the next session, believe it or not, is myself and Tom. I'm talking about the um, the uh, Great Plague of 1348. And Tom is talking about medical, the influence of medical conditions on political judgments are yeah outside not in the middle east in in europe and and that's in I think the second week of, of february so thanks very much everybody